Hello to everyone. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to this Amatech Land Incorporated webinar. My name is Rich and I'm a senior manager with IEEE Global Spec. Okay, now to get this webinar started, I'd like to introduce to you Amatech Land Global Product Manager, Richard Gag. Richard, go right ahead. Good morning. My name is Richard Gag. I'm Market Sector Manager for Metals with Amatech Land and I'm here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today I'm going to talk about temperature measurement using non-contact radiation pyrometers. I'm also going to cover some conventional contact type measurements and compare them with these. Within temperature measurement devices, there are two broad groups of instruments used. Their contact temperature measurement groups, and they include things like thermocouples, thermistors, RTDs, liquid filled or vapor filled systems, and bimetallic strips. With the non contact measurements, these are predominantly radiation pyrometers. What do we call these? non-contact temperature measuring devices. Radiation thermometer is the name agreed upon by ASTM. Pyrometer is the older and more common name for these instruments. It's derived from the Greek root pyro that means fire. Many people will call them infrared thermometers or infrared pyrometers even though some of the models operate outside of the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Many people simply refer to them as pyrometers because they've heard that word before. As an introduction, let's look at the electromagnetic spectrum. At the very short end of the spectrum, which is where very, very high temperatures exist, it's mostly gamma rays. As temperatures start to come down, we come into an area of the spectrum where X-rays exist. And then at slightly longer wavelengths, at slightly lower temperatures, we come into the ultraviolet. And then finally, into the visible part of the spectrum. And this small part of the spectrum is where our eyes operate. The visible part of the spectrum is also the part of the electromagnetic spectrum where color exists. As you come to lower and lower temperatures, you come into the infrared part of the spectrum, and then past that, you go to radio waves. Now let's look at what parts of the electromagnetic spectrum are useful for measuring temperatures that we come across. These Planck curves show the distribution of radiated energy at various temperatures. Let me explain how they work. If you look at the highest curve, the red curve, that shows 5,770 Kelvin. 5,770 Kelvin is the temperature of our sun. And so, if one looks underneath the red curve, you will see the wavelengths which are emitted from the sun. The peak of the wavelengths is where visible energy exists. And you can see this with the rainbow of color on this graph. And the peak of that visible part of the spectrum from the sun is what we know as the, the color green. Our eyes have adapted to the maximum radiation from the sun so that we can better see reflections of our surroundings and we can see and not bump into things. Now let's look at another example. If we look at the black curve, which is shown as 288 Kelvin, 288 Kelvin is around 15 degrees Celsius or around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see there that radiation is available to measure anywhere from 2 micrometers out to a few hundred micrometers. 
Now, if we were to use our radiation detectors, which are our eyes, and try and see temperatures at 15 degrees Celsius, we wouldn't be able to. If we sat in a room with no windows and turned out the lights, everything would be black. And that's because there's no short wavelength energy in the visible spectrum at those temperatures. And so a designer of a radiation pyrometer for those lower temperatures would have to choose slightly longer wavelengths enabled to use and measure this energy which is available. Here we see a representation of a pyrometer looking at a hot object. Radiation from that hot object travels to the pyrometer, is focused by the pyrometer's lens onto a detector, and then that de detector through an amplifier quantifies that energy into a temperature reading. All objects above absolute zero, which is zero Kelvin, which equates to minus 273 Celsius or minus 460 Fahrenheit, all of those objects will radiate energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. And so the pyrometer measures the object's temperature simply by looking at and receiving the emitted energy arriving from that target material. In the next few slides, we're going to talk about emissivity. Emissivity is the ability of an object to emit or radiate its temperature energy. A perfect emitter, something which is able to emit 100% of its energy, is known as a black body. In this representation, we can see this object Internally, it has 100% energy. If 100% energy can escape from the surface and none is reflected back internally, then this is said to have an emissivity value of 1 because it radiates 100% of that energy. Perfect emitters or black bodies really don't exist in nature. Most items radiate less than the amount of energy that's within them. So here we'll take an object which has an emissivity value of 0 0.4. And so in this case, only 40% of the object's energy is able to be radiated from the surface. And the remaining 60% is reflected back internally within the object. So this is an item with an emissivity value of 0 0.4. Let's show this in another way. We have two objects here. One is dark and rough. The other one is shiny and smooth. The dark and rough object will absorb radiation very well, whereas that smooth and shiny object doesn't absorb radiation that well. Let's look at radiation from these same two objects. The dark and rough object is a good emitter. It radiates a lot of its energy. Again, the shiny and smooth object doesn't emit much of its energy. And so good absorbers are also good emitters and poor absorbers are also poor emitters. So let's look at some of these examples in the real world. In the upper photograph, we see a strip of aluminum in a hot rolling mill. And in this photograph, our eyes show us that it is very reflective. Emissivity equals one minus reflectivity. And so if something is very reflective, it is not very emissive. Conversely, in the lower photograph, we see coke on a conveyor belt. And our eyes show us that it is dark, rough, not very reflective. 
and therefore it has a high emissivity and a low reflectivity. So again, emissivity equals 1 minus reflectivity. In this slide, we see emissivity value examples for common materials. So we see that unoxidized steel, think of that as liquid steel, has an emissivity of 0 0.35. Whereas if it is oxidized and rough and dark, then it has a higher emissivity of 0 0.85. So it's emitting 85% of its energy. If we look at aluminum, an oxidized aluminum is a very low emissivity around 0 0.13. And fully oxidized aluminum has a higher, but still not very high emissivity of 0 0.4. Now the next one, the next two copper are quite interesting. You'll see that oxidized copper, and think of that as copper that's dark and covered with verdigris, has a very high emissivity value of 0 0.8. However, if you clean that copper and polish it up and think about a shiny copper kettle, the emissivity value is much, much lower, 0 0.06. Only 6% of the energy is capable of being emitted from the surface. Finally, the last three examples on here are non-metals, brick, asphalt, and asbestos. And here you can see that they all have quite high and stable emissivity values. So what are some factors which can affect the emissivity of an object? We've already seen in the previous table that something which is unoxidized or very oxidized can have a different emissivity value. So that's surface condition. We'll cover these in a little more detail in a few minutes. Also, the operating wavelength that we work at will affect emissivity values on some materials. The viewing angle to the surface, and then also the temperature of the material. If the temperature of the material is extremely high and it starts to glow, the emissivity value will tend to rise. So let's look at surface condition here for one material, stainless steel. So with an unoxidized surface, very smooth, shiny, the emissivity is 0 0.3. Only 30% of the energy is able to be emitted or radiated from the surface. If it becomes lightly oxidized, the emissivity goes up slightly. And if it's heavily oxidized, it goes up considerably. Now let's have a look at how the wavelength of the pyrometer that's being used can affect the emissivity setting that you need to use with that material. So there are some common infrared radiation pyrometers out there operating in the infrared part of the spectrum between 8 and 14 micrometers. And if you use one of those to look at molten iron, the emissivity value is quite low at 0 0.1. As you get to shorter wavelengths, so let's look across to 2 micrometers, you'll see that the emissivity value of that same material is now much higher at around 0.23. And so the emissivity has risen considerably at that shorter wavelength. Now if we look at 1 micrometer, which is a very popular wavelength for high temperature items, we'll see that the emissivity has now risen to 0 0.35. So it's capable of emitting 35% of its energy now. If you go even further and out of the infrared into the visible part of the spectrum to a shorter wavelength of around 0 0.55 micrometers, you'll see that the emissivity value has risen now to 0 0.45, which is a huge gain over 0 0.35 at just one micrometer. And so a pyrometer designer looking to measure temperatures for molten iron would tend to use very short wavelength detectors, very short wavelength pyrometers, operating 
short of the, the infrared and into the visible part of the spectrum. So now let's look at the effect of an emissivity change on a surface, or if you were to set the emissivity value on the pyrometer slightly in error, and what effect that will have at different wavelengths. So let's look at that top blue curve, which is the long wavelength pyrometer for 8 to 14 micrometers. If you had an object at 500 degrees Celsius, and you made a 1% emissivity error in setting, or alternatively, if the emissivity of the object changed by 1%, then you could expect to see a temperature change on that item of almost 4 degrees Celsius at 500. Now, if you go through lower and shorter and shorter wavelengths, and you now go down to the red curve, which is at one micrometer, you can see at the same temperature at 500 degrees Celsius, if you made a 1% error in the emissivity setting, that would be the equivalent of just 0 0.3 Celsius difference in reading. So you see here, there's a huge advantage to using the shortest wavelength that you can for a particular temperature measurement. And so there's a basic rule of thumb where you always choose the shortest wavelength for the temperature that you're trying to measure. The emissivity of a surface can also change with the viewing angle. For most materials, if the viewing angle is straight onto the object, which is normal, through 45 degrees from normal, the emissivity value will stay the same. So knowing this, it's quite easy to position a pyrometer to measure the temperature of something and know the emissivity. However, if you go at more glancing angles than 45 degrees from normal, the majority of the materials will have lower and lower and lower emissivities the more of a glancing angle you get to. Here we see a graph that shows this effect. Here we see a metal that has an emissivity value of 0 0.9. And you'll see here that as you go from normal all the way out to 45 degrees from normal, the emissivity value stays at 0 0.9. And it's only after 45 degrees from normal that the angular viewing effect will give you lower and lower emissivities. And so you can see that by 65 degrees from normal, the emissivities drop from 0.9 to 0.8. And then the further you get, the more glancing angle you get, the emissivity value cascades away. Now, let me give you a, a real world example so you can visualize this. You remember earlier on one of the slides, I showed the emissivity value of asphalt, which is the material that we put on roads. So if you can imagine a road surface and that road going to, out to the horizon and it being a sunny day, to your eyes, that road would look dark. It would have quite a high emissivity value of 0.85. But the further you look out towards the horizon, the lighter the road will become. And at the horizon, you will see a shimmering reflection, which is a mirage. And what that mirage is, is a total lack of emissivity. And emissivity equals one minus reflectivity. And so it's a perfect reflector out there. And so what you are seeing in that mirage is a reflection of radiation from the sky. So after all this talk about emissivity, how do you know what emissivity value to use? Well, it's actually quite easy. If you look in the user guide for the radiation pyrometer that you bought, in that user guide will be a table of materials with different surface finishes and different temperatures and against them will be the emissivity values of those materials. 
And so simply follow those tables and you will find the correct emissivity value to use for that pyrometer. Now, if you find a material which is more exotic, undocumented, then if it's possible to make a temperature measurement of that material by using a contact thermometer, then you can make a measurement with the contact thermometer. You can then look at that same temperature point on that material with the pyrometer, adjust its emissivity value until both of the readings match. And what you've just done is back calculated the emissivity value of that material. Now, in a lot of cases, it's not possible to touch a surface with a contact device. And then in this case, we could determine the emissivity of the material in a laboratory. And most suppliers of these radiation pyrometers will be able to supply you details of how you would prepare a sample of material to send back to have it tested and quantified in their laboratory. Sometimes if you have a problematic, very low emissivity material, it's possible to raise the emissivity of that material by doing something to it. In this example, we see a chrome plated roll typical to what would be used in a paper mill. And the surface of that chrome plated roll is very reflective and has a very low emissivity value of 0 0.1. However, if you were to pick part of that roll that is towards the edge and not in contact with the paper, you may be allowed to paint a stripe on that roll, and then you could measure the temperature of that stripe because that paint would have a much higher emissivity of 0 0.85 and be very easy to measure in those conditions. Another way to raise the emissivity of a material is to change its shape. And so this is how people would make a black body calibration source. They would take a material like silicon carbide, which may have an emissivity value of 0 0.85. But then if you produce a cavity within it of at least six diameters depth to the diameter of the cavity, the multiple internal reflections that occur within that cavity will integrate together to give an emissivity value of almost what, in this example, 0 0.99. So this is how manufacturers produce black body calibration sources and they have typically emissivities of 0.99 or even higher 0.995. Similar cavities exist in the real world. So here in this schematic, we see a segment of a, a round process roll in a hot rolling mill. And you see a piece of hot steel that's emerging from being rolled by that roll. And the gap that's between the surface of that roll and the surface of the hot metal is known in industry terms as a roll nip or a wedge. And that cavity, through multiple internal reflections, integrates the emissivity to a much higher value close to one. And so, for instance, if you had a, an operation that was rolling different emissivity materials, that cavity and measuring into that cavity would get you around having to change the emissivity value as those different materials were rolled. In this thermal image of a down coiler in an aluminium rolling plant, we see the strip coming towards the coil and then being coiled up at the end of the line. This thermal image is showing us the thermal radiation emitted from that coil and the strip. And what you see as that very bright, shiny line, that yellow line, is the enhancement of emissivity in that wedge area.
It's not that the temperature is higher in there. It's that the aluminum, which has an emissivity of 0.13, in that cavity has an emissivity of close to 1. And so it's emitting much more efficiently, and it's a very easy measurement to make compared with looking at the strip where there is no cavity. If there isn't a cavity, you can make one. So this device is known as an emissivity enhancer. And these are widely available and they fit onto the front of radiation pyrometers. And what you have here in cross section is a gold plated hemisphere. That gold plating on the surface is extremely highly reflective which will cause any emissions from the surface to bounce around inside that sphere. They'll integrate together and then they finally escape through that very small aperture at the top of the hemisphere onto a detector and are measured. And so you can change the emissivity of a surface simply by using a device like this and bring the emissivity value up to a very high value close to one. Here's one of these emissivity enhancers being used in an aluminum extrusion plant. And so in the top left photograph, you will see a round billet of aluminum that is just exiting a billet reheat furnace. It's exiting at around 500 degrees. The first thing you see is that it is not glowing, and that's because the emissivity is very, very low. And so it's not able to emit its, its temperature. The second thing you can see is that the sides of the billet are all different kinds of finishes. So some shiny on the front face, uh, rough with scratches and things on the side faces. So there's variability in that emissivity also. You'll see in the side rail of the line here mounted a gold cup hemisphere device, an emissivity enhancer. And in this particular case, that is connected via a fiber optic back to a remote detector and amplifier. And so regardless of the emissivity finish of that material, you make a very constant and high and good temperature measurement. Now let's look at a typical pyrometer and what goes into its design. So we'll see that this transparent area here is the body of the pyrometer itself. Within the pyrometer is a, a radiation detector. Usually in front of the detector is some form of a bandpass filter, which will allow you to tune the response of that detector to certain wavelengths. In this particular design now, we have a front-faced mirror, which is simply bending the ray cone towards the lens. We have a lens, a protection window, and then we've got a representation of the pyrometer's field of view going out into the distance and then looking at a hot target. In this schematic, you can see the same pyrometer looking at that hot target. And what we're showing here is that with a conventional monochromatic pyrometer, the temperature reading is coming from averaging the temperature of everything in that target spot. And so you want the hot target to be larger than the target spot so that it's not also averaging background temperature into the readings. In this schematic, we see the same pyrometer and now it is looking at a hot target which does not fill the field of view of the pyrometer. And so what this monochromatic thermometer will do is it will, it will measure the temperature of that hot target, but also within that measurement circle, it will be averaging lower temperature from the cold background and it will be giving you a falsely low reading. So you should always ensure that the instrument is focused onto the object and is capable of seeing the object and none of the background. Now, there are some different design pyrometers which accommodate this kind of 
measurement. And these are known as ratio or two color pyrometers. And instead of an intensity of the output from the single detector, temperature is related to the ratio of the two outputs from the two detectors at two wavelengths. And so if both detectors are seeing 50% output, they have the same ratio as both detectors seeing 100%. And so that type of thermometer is very good for environments where you have an object which cannot fill the field of view or something where you have obscuration like lots of clouds of dust. Let's look here at the relationship between distance from the target and the target diameter, the target size. So in this example, we have a portable pyrometer with fully focusable optics, and the pyrometer field of view is expressed as 200 to 1. What that means is that every 200 units of distance you go away, the target diameter grows by one unit. And so in this particular case, somebody has focused this at a distance of one meter, which is 1,000 millimeters. If you divide that by 200, you'll see the target size is five millimeters. Now, with this pyrometer and with other pyrometers, you have a through the lens sighting so that not only can you see where that target spot is, but you can also see how large it is. That's very important. On some low cost pyrometers, they do not have through the lens sighting or cameras within them. And so they will just have a single red laser dot. It's important to understand that that laser dot is only defining the center of that measurement circle. It's not defining the diameter of that measurement circle. And so if you're not aware of that, you might think that, oh yes, the thermometer is looking at that object and none of the background, when in fact, the target diameter at that distance might be 75 millimeters and the object is only 50 millimeters and you're getting a much lower reading because you're also averaging background temperatures. In this schematic, we have the same pyrometer with adjustable optics and with a 200 to 1 field of view. And now the operator has adjusted the focus to something which is further away at 1.5 meters. And so the spot diameter there is 1500 millimeters divided by 200, which is a 7.5 millimeter spot. Some pyrometers are fiber optic based. So here we see a pyrometer which has a fiber optic light guide, which then goes a great distance to a small refocusing lens which is mounted close to the target. And then this fiber optic light guide could then be threaded through uh, a maze of machinery back to a remote sensor. That remote sensor may not otherwise be able to see something that's happening inside of a machine. Other applications for fiber optics are when you have very high ambient temperatures and you cannot use water cooling. And so in this particular case, the lens could take 200 Celsius or 400 Fahrenheit with no cooling at all. And you could put the electronics and the amplifier back in a cool area, which is 70 Celsius. Another use for these two is if you have an environment with a very high RF field, an induction field, for instance, then you could mount this lens very close to the measurement and put the electronics far away from that induction field. Let's now go through some of the basics of what you're familiar with in contact thermometers. And some things are maybe so obvious that you don't realize. First of all, if you're using a contact thermometer, then you have to touch or contact the surface of the object that you want to measure. If you want to do that, 
you've also got to be close enough to the object to touch it. What a lot of people don't realize is that if you touch a hot object with a thermocouple, for the first few seconds, that cold thermocouple will conduct heat away from the surface and the reading will be falsely low. And so you should really wait for a few seconds with the thermocouple to get to the same temperature as the surface that you are touching. If you don't, you get falsely low readings. In a similar way, if you're trying to measure the temperature of a very cold object, then that thermocouple can conduct heat to the surface and warm that area, and the reading that you are getting is falsely high. If you're trying to measure the temperature of a moving object with a thermocouple, that can be very difficult because there'll be a frictional effect from the surface scraping along that product. Also with conventional contact thermometers, if you touch an object, you can damage it. So for instance, if it was delicate plastic, you may damage it by touching it, or you could contaminate it. So if it were a food or a pharmaceutical product, that wouldn't be good. Also, if you're measuring very hot objects for long periods, the thermocouple tip can migrate, giving you a drift in readings, which is unrecoverable, and you have to recycle and replace that thermocouple. A contact thermometer, by being in contact with the process, can erode or corrode. A contact thermometer can conduct electricity. If somebody says to you, go over there with that two foot long thermocouple and measure the temperature of the insulator on that 100,000 volt power supply, you might be wise not to do that. You can't use a thermocouple to measure a surface of a material if it's being heated by a flame. If that flame is playing onto the surface and you're trying to measure the temperature of that surface as it's being heated by the flame, the thermocouple will take on the temperature of the flame itself and will be no good for making this temperature measurement. A thermocouple or RTD cannot operate in induction fields. Those induction fields would excite the device and it would give vastly incorrect readings. Thermocouples and RTDs usually have very slow response speeds, even slower if they're in protective sheaths. And in furnace applications where you want to measure the temperature of the product, thermocouples are actually measuring the temperature of the furnace and not the product. Radiation pyrometers are excellent for measuring moving items because they don't touch the item. There's no chance of a frictional effect. Also, you can be distant to the item. You don't need to be close to it. Measurement of distant items, no need again to get close. Because a radiation pyrometer simply looks at the surface and the radiation being emitted from the surface, it doesn't conduct temperature away from the surface and it doesn't conduct temperature to the surface. So the measurement is much better than a contact device. The measurement doesn't contaminate the measurement measured item because it's not touching it. So again, it's not contaminating something that may be prone to contamination. The device doesn't wear out like a contact measurement item would do because it doesn't come in contact with the process, it doesn't get eroded or corroded by the process. And because of this, they have very low maintenance. Even when making very high temperature measurements, there is no drift over time, like with a thermocouple hot junction that could migrate. Measurements are possible in dangerous areas. So again, if you want to measure the temperature of something which is high voltage, you don't have to get close to it. All you have to do is look at it with the pyrometer. And then the response speed of the item is extremely fast in milliseconds.
by selecting the type and the wavelength of the pyrometer, you can do things that cannot be done by contact means. So for instance, you may choose a wavelength that will see thin film plastics like saran wrap as being completely opaque. And simply by looking at them, you can measure the incoming radiation and measure the temperature without damaging the surface of the plastic. You can measure glass surface temperatures. Also, by choosing the wavelength, you can measure subsurface temperatures, which is not possible with a contact device. You can measure temperatures through clouds of dust. You can measure temperatures through flames. You can choose wavelengths where the flames are transparent and you see the surface of a material that is being heated by a flame and not see the flame itself. You can measure the temperatures of products in furnaces and not the atmosphere of the furnace. You can measure the temperatures of items in induction fields, which is not possible using a contact device. You can measure temperatures of items that are being heated by a laser. Simply by choosing a wavelength that is far away from the wavelength of the laser, the laser reflections are not visible by the pyrometer. And you can measure combustion gas temperatures without intruding into the gas stream. So in the example of incinerators, people would use exotic sheathed thermocouples measuring exhaust gas temperatures, but they would have to replace those sheaths and thermocouples on a regular basis. In the case of a non-contact device, it simply looks through a window into there and does not come in contact with those erosive and corrosive gases. So as we've seen, there are many applications where radiation pyrometers are not just accurate and good, but they're the only method of accurate temperature measurement. We don't expect you to become an expert on this yourselves. This is why radiation thermometer manufacturers have application specialists, and we can assist you in selecting the correct device for your particular application. Okay, I'm coming to the end of my presentation now, and shortly I'm going to take questions from you. First of all, I want to thank you for attending. Uh, I know your time is very important. Also, there will be a link sent to everyone for access to this presentation if you need to view it at a later time. And if in weeks or months to come, you think you may have questions that you should have asked now, you can always contact me by email at richard.gag at amatech.com. Okay, let's go to the question and answer session. Okay, Richard, thank you very much for that great presentation. Now, we do have time for a few questions, but before we get to those, we'd like to let all of our audience know that if we don't get to your question, we'll have an answer for you following the webinar. Okay, Richard, here's your first question. How do I know the emissivity of my steel forging? Well, the, the easiest way is to look up the emissivity value in the tables at the back of the user guide for that pyrometer. If you don't have that available and it's possible, you could also touch the item with a thermocouple and then adjust the emissivity dial on the instrument until the two readings match. Okay, Richard, thank you for that answer. Here's another question. Why is through the lens sighting an advantage? Well, with through the lens sighting, you don't only confirm the target is being measured, but you also see what size of area on the target uh, is being measured. With a, a, some very low cost pyrometers, they have a, a little red laser dot, which tells you the center of the area that's being measured, but not the size of it. If you have through the lens sighting, then what you see is the true size of that target spot, and you can confirm what's actually being measured. And thanks one more time, Richard, for that answer. Here's another question that came in. We harden alloy surfaces with a new laser system. 
Can an infrared thermometer measure the metal surface temperature during the operation? Uh, yes, it can. Um, you need to call one of our application specialists and what they will do is guide you through selecting the right pyrometer of the right wavelength that will not be affected by that laser. Okay, thanks, Richard. Here's another question that came in. Can a pyrometer measure a paper web? And secondly, isn't it very hot? Yes, um, we have customers measuring paper and non-woven materials with single spot pyrometers. We've also got some of them using thermal line scanners. Some of these materials can be slightly transparent and we select a wavelength that will see that paper web as opaque. There are many pyrometers that are designed to measure very low temperatures, even below freezing. So pyrometers for paper have very rapid response speeds and are completely non-contact, and so you don't stand a chance of damaging the paper web. Okay, Richard, and as a follow-up to that answer, this next questioner asks, do you have additional information on this subject? I'd like to know more. Yes. Um, if you email us, uh, you could send an email to richard.gag at amatech.com. Uh, after this session, then uh, just put in your question there and I can arrange to get you more materials. Thank you very much, Richard, for that answer. Here's the next question. Which is the average accuracy of pyrometers? Well, the typical measurement uncertainty depends on the model that you choose, but it's typically very accurate between 0.25 and 0.4% of the pyrometer's reading. Okay, Richard, and as a follow-up to that, which range of temperature can they measure? Uh, well, we can measure below zero Celsius. We can measure over 3,000 Celsius. So you just select the model for your particular application. Okay, Richard, thank you for that answer. We've got time for one more question, I think. Do these principles apply for portable and fixed pyrometers? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they are the same regardless of the of the form factor of the pyrometer. Um, after saying that, some portables, you'll see some portables out there that are $30 each, low temperature, have very poor measurement accuracy, very bad optics. So if you're using a portable, just make sure that you buy a high quality one and then it works in exactly the same way as a high quality fixed thermometer and it will measure temperatures very accurately. Okay, Richard, thank you very much for that last answer and we are out of time. So we're going to have to wrap up this webinar right there. Richard Gag, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with all of us today. Thanks again, take care and have yourselves a great day.